So indeed, yes, as we have sung this morning, Holy Spirit, rest on us. Just as the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters before the creation of the world. Just as God today hovers over each and every one of us in intimacy. We can't see him, but we know him. His word says he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is with us always. He hovers over us by the power of his spirit. And God indeed, in Genesis 3, said, let there be. And this morning, as we share the truth of the word together, I encourage you to consider what God is saying in the let there be into your life, as I consider what is God saying to me, let there be into my life. We're in strange times at this moment in time in this nation because Her Majesty the Queen has died. The whole atmosphere of the nation has changed. As people have gone into the grief of the loss, they may have never met her. They only know about her. But something has gripped their emotion in the sense of change that is taking place right now in our nation. The people are speaking out regular messages of condolence and speaking out who Queen Elizabeth II was to them, what they know of her, what they remember, the impact her life has had upon this nation. And yet many people have been stirred, not only in the remembrance and to stand with the royal family in their grief, they've been stirred in their own emotions, in their own grief too. Having just gone through the pandemic times, with many losses of life. Many people were not able to have the funeral that they desired to have for their loved ones. Many people were restricted in so many ways of not being able to share that outpouring of grief that came upon them in the loss of those loved ones. And the practicality of reduced numbers at funerals, many funerals didn't take place. Many funerals did not happen in the way that people desired that it perhaps should have done. So there are many people being stirred today, in this mourning, this grieving, for a woman that they have no personal connection with. There is an outpouring of grief that has been triggered out of the pain that those people have carried for so long. And it's almost as though queuing for hours to go past her coffin is their way of expressing, I desire to do this for my loved one. And I wasn't able to do it. It's releasing something in them that has been buried in pain for a long, long time. That they go to show honour to the Queen. That they go to release something inside of them too. So many mixed emotions and very definitely a shift in the atmosphere that's taking place at this time. That people begin to fear, what does the future hold? We, We know who the Queen was. We know who she stood for. She stood confident in the Lord Jesus Christ and she many times spoke his name over the messages that she delivered to the nation, that she included him in the journey. Many people are asking, who is King Charles III? What is his faith belief? Where does he stand? What different character is he to his mum? How much transitions forward out of protocol, out of the example of his mother over his life, and yet the individuality of who he is and all that he will now bring to the nation. We're not sure because we don't know him like we used to hear from the Queen. And the reality is there is a shaking. There's a shaking in the spirit that is happening over this nation. We've even had change of government. And the danger is all the grief going onto the Queen, all the news stories being focused permanently upon the loss of the queen what is government doing in the background 
that we're not able to see it or hear it because the news is not reporting it, because everything's focused upon the loss of, of the Queen. What is it that the enemy is up to in the background of all things that we're not aware of, we cannot see, we're not hearing? Because it's camouflaged by what has been brought full focus across our lives now. As a nation, we need to wake up. As a nation, there is a shaking taking place. And we know there is God on one side, but there is an enemy on the other who wants to destroy each and every one of us, who wants to distract each and every one of us, who has brought, us, brought across our vision and our life every day, the news that is reported, that is all focused in one direction. But there is an enemy working behind the scenes. And only when the funeral has taken place and the nation starts to settle back into whatever normal life will be for people beyond it, will suddenly the reality come to be. We have a new prime minister. We have a new government. What has been taking place behind the scenes in these days that is so hidden? And we need to wake up ourselves. We need to be alert and we need to be in prayer because the enemy does not rest. And whatever he is weaving in that web of deceit in the background of all things that, that at this moment in time, it will come upon us. But we serve a holy God. We stand confident in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be everything that he is and all that he desires to be in our life. And as we turn to him, he shows us the way. We have such hope. We are overcomers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our peace. He is our joy despite the circumstance. Even if it's triggered an outpouring of grief in us over the loss of the queen, whatever pain has been released in us because of her death. We have a holy God that we can turn to who knows all things. He knows what we've buried. He knows what we've cast aside. He knows what we're in denial of. He knows what we're being distracted from. But whenever we bury the pain inside us, there's going to come a time where that pain will come up again. And we have to choose to confront it. Everything buried inside us, and all of us are in that place that over the years we've been hurt in different ways. And many times we have run away, or we try to run away. I say try to run away because we never get away from it. If we don't confront in truth to find the peace in the moment, we're going to bury that pain inside each and every one of us. And every pain that we've, we've suffered, every trauma we've gone through, the pain gets buried inside us and we push it down. And then the next offense comes, the next pain is caused and we take it on board, but we don't deal with it. So we take it and it goes inward and it goes in us and we push it down. So we are all in that burial status of the disasters, the traumas, the heartache, the pain, the grief, the struggle that we have is all buried inside us. But there's only so much burying that we can do. And for each and every one of us, we may have already had those moments or that moment is going to come where suddenly something quite trivial happens and it causes us pain. But we react to that trivial point and out of us just breaks forth all the agony and the pain and the trauma and the disaster that has been buried for so long it's like the volcano that is inside us that is waiting to erupt and we think we're in control but there is something that is going to happen one day if it hasn't happened already that will be the key that will release that volcano and there will be that breakout of agony that will come from our guts to have to confront the pain that we've buried for far too long. And the answer is always Jesus Christ. But when we are prepared to confront our pain and go to him in truth and allow him to minister to us his truth, there is hope, there is freedom, there is healing, there is a restoration, there is a reconciliation of broken relationships. There's a reconciliation back to us, all that God wants us to, us to enjoy at this moment in time. But how do we deal with it? 
I'm going to dance around a little bit in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14 is where Jesus very much demonstrates the truth of how he orders his own steps over our own lives, how he demonstrates the truth and the power of how we should deal with the pain that we are encountering. That in these days, as this nation has been stirred and all this pain is surfacing, there is a way forward for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if it starts at the beginning in Matthew 14, John the Baptist, the cousin of the Lord Jesus Christ, is dead. The king has had him killed. Note in that, when you read it for yourself, the king did not want to take John the Baptist's life, but he was manipulated into doing so to please people. But the reality is that in Matthew 14, verse 13, we already know that John the Baptist is dead. And in verse 13, it says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. What is Jesus's first response to disaster? What is Jesus's first response to the agony and the pain? His own emotions bubbling up in the loss of John the Baptist, whom he loved so much. He withdrew privately to a solitary place. I'm sure there's many times in this last few days, the royal family have just wished they could just retire privately to a quiet place to mourn the loss of the queen. That because of their public role, they are grieving with the nation with them. But Jesus demonstrates that in his grief, he withdrew privately to a solitary place. He went on his own before God the Father. Whenever we have trauma cut across our life, there is a God who cares, God who knows the end from the beginning. He knew what was going to happen before we even knew that it had happened. And he's already there waiting to take hold of us, to embrace us, to encourage us, to love us, and to nurture us in his truth beyond all things. But having taken time out in the privacy of his own grief, he then goes on to say, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. In his own pain, Jesus withdrew to go before the Father. And yet, the people needed Jesus. So he didn't hide away. He didn't go into the pity party. He didn't let life completely stop. That the only thing that mattered was him in his grief. He was aware that there were people who needed what he was able to bring into their lives. So it says, when he saw the large crowd, he had compassion then, com compassion on them and healed the sick. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ still went on. Despite all the heartache, all the agony of what was going on in his personal life, he was still confident enough to be able to stand and be who he needed to be to the people at, them, at that moment in time. And then as you go on to verse 13, sorry, beyond verse 13, it actually talks of they're in a remote place and there's all these people, more than 5,000. It says Jesus feeds the 5,000, but there was more than 5,000. For every man who had a wife, maybe had two children, you're talking 15 to 20,000 people who had gathered in the crowd to be able to hear what Jesus had to say. That Jesus, despite his grief and his pain, ministered to them. And then they needed feeding, physically, food. And so we have the story of the five loaves of bread and the two fishes that multiplied in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ to provide the need of the people at that moment in time. 
In his pain, Jesus withdrew before the Father for the solace that he needed. But in his compassion for the people who needed his Father, he stepped into place and he ministered to the people and he took care of all their needs, including their physical flesh. And then it says at the end of verse 20, they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. And then once the task is done, there is a moving on. And as we start in verse 22, which is where I really want to begin today, is that having gone through all that and still carrying the grief, Jesus is still determined in the task right in front of him. So in verse 22, it says, immediately. So he's fed the 5,000 plus people. He's ministered to them and brought healing into their lives. But there comes a point where they have to move on. And it says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. There came a point where Jesus knew this encounter with him of the people was going to move on. He had to go. There were other people to see, other things to do. He couldn't stay in that place. So he cuts across the the flow of the circumstance and he says to the disciples, get into that boat and go on ahead of me and I will dismiss the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. He has ministered to those people. He's been all that he needs to be to them. But when it's complete, what does he do? He goes straight back into the presence of the Father. He goes up onto the mountainside, isolated away yet again, so that he could pray. There's many things going on in our own lives right now which would cause us to be stopped in our tracks, that we get so consumed by them, so obsessed with the detail of the natural that's going on in front of us, that we've taken our eye off the ball, we've closed down away from responsibilities that we carry, we are breaking relationship with many people who care, and as we isolate it away, we are putting ourselves in a prison as we cycle round the pain, as we get obsessed by the circumstance, and we cannot see the wood for the trees. What is distracting us right now? What has taken over and consumed us right now? What has taken us out of position right now? Every single one of us, no matter what the pain and the trauma that is going on, has a responsibility and a duty of care to those around us. There are still jobs to be done, families to be fed, husband and wife to come together to love, to encourage, support each other. If in our pain we isolate away completely, the word says that the enemy prowls, prowls around like a roaring lion, choosing to devour each and every one of us. In other words, in the distress in the enemy's camp, where we go into the pity party with the devil, the enemy takes hold of us and he separates away from everybody who loves us, everybody who cares. Everybody that God would surround us with to be able to support us, encourage us through the trauma. And because we get so consumed with ourselves, we forget the responsibilities that we carry. So we don't go to work. Or if we go to work, we go to work in our pain and we don't focus into the responsibility and be grateful for the job that we have, but we do not do it well. There are many marriages breaking down because there is trauma in husband or wife, but instead of talking to each other and allowing our spouse to love us through it, we separate in the isolation and we're taken down under the circumstance. There are children who need looking after, but we, we do the basics for them, but we don't connect with them. We're not concerned about their hurt, their pain, and the trauma that's going on in their life right now because we're so consumed with us, ourselves, the me, myself, and I. And that's what the enemy will do. He will separate us away from, that we get distracted away from all that should naturally flow in and through our lives, not only for ourselves, but into the lives of other people too. 
Jesus has his moments, like it says here, that he withdrew to the mountainside by himself, but he went into the presence of a holy God. He didn't just sit there under the circumstance feeling sorry for himself. He went to draw on the very authority and truth and power of God the Father himself, to, who knew the pain. But it's in this presence of a holy God that Jesus was equipped and stirred afresh and filled up by the power of the Holy Spirit to step out again into what God was going to do next. And it says, later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So in the middle of the night in the mountainside, he looks up and he can see the disciples in the boat on the waves, and they've already traveled some distance. He was aware of them. But he stayed in place. And he's aware there's a storm brewing and the waves, because of the wind, were coming against the boat and was going to cause distress for the disciples. There's a wind of change happening in the spirit right now over our lives that we don't know what today holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But there's something that's going to come against us at some point in our life that is going to buff, buff it against us. It's going to hit us and it's going to shake us, just like the disciples were being buffeted around in the boat. There may be a pain even right now going on in your life. You're in the middle of the storm and you don't know the way out. Jesus does. Jesus is watching. Jesus knows all things. And he's saying, my child, will you come aside with me? to search out my truth for you right now. So he's watching from a distance. He's aware that the storm is brewing. And then it says, shortly before dawn. So how long has Jesus been up on the mountainside? He fed the people the previous night, and then he left them. He sent the disciples away. Jesus left the people and went to the mountain. He has been on the mountain all night, alone with God the Father. Searching out the infilling of the power of the Holy Spirit and the peace to equip him, to enable him to keep moving forward. And he doesn't tell us what Jesus prayed about. Doesn't go into the detail of his emotions, his heartache, the suffering, the trauma. It just simply says he spent time in God's presence. And in verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Shortly before dawn, he has been there all night. But there comes a time where Jesus has to come out of the presence of God, and as the dawn breaks, get on with what that day will hold for the ministry that he brings. And it says he walks out on the lake. Only Jesus Christ, filled up by the power of the Holy Spirit, the divinity of who he is as God, can walk on water. The natural gravity on which we stand pulls us down. We stand on solid ground. We cannot levitate. We cannot go up in our own free will bodies. Gravity holds us to the ground. And we all know if we were at the side of the swimming pool and we were to step up onto the water, we all know exactly know what is going to happen. We will fall down to the bottom of the pool. Everything scientifically of what Jesus did defies logic. And it can because he is God. He is divine. He is supernatural. So he walks on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Now just put yourself in the position of the disciples. Everyday people like you and me, never seen somebody walking on water before. They're out in the middle of the ocean, in the pitch black of the night. The storm is rocking the boat all over the place. There's a fear come upon them. They think they're going to drown. What we have to remember is that these are fishermen. They know the waters. They know what it's like. And there's a storm there with the winds buffeting the boat and bringing the water up over the boat as a natural fear that they believe they're going to drown. And then they have this figure appearing on the water, walking towards them, and they've never seen it before. So they think it's a ghost. They knew it was a supernatural apparition. What they didn't do was recognize Jesus Christ. 
who they fellowshiped with, who they ministered with, who they followed around, who did miracles. But in their fear, they were blinded to not to be able to identify him. And that's the first thing that happens in our circumstance. When something comes upon us, the fear comes upon us and we get blinded and we cannot see Jesus right in the middle of the circumstance. We look so much at the natural detail of what's going on, we get blinded by the detail as we focus onto the detail, but we keep talking about the problem as it is in the natural, and the more we talk about it in the natural, the bigger the problem becomes, because the more we focus into it, that circumstance gets totally magnified out of proportion. And our imaginations take over and we start to feed all our own natural understanding into it. And the enemy uses our imagination to twist what is a simple heartache in the moment to become a major trauma for life. We have to take every thought captive. We have to turn. We have to go into that solitude before our holy God to say, God, what is going on here? Show me your truth about what is happening here. Why is that person saying that? Why is that person doing that? Why am I not allowed to be there? Why can't I go and do what I believe I'm supposed to go and do? What is stopping me, Lord, and why? And as the fear comes upon us, the fear of missing out, the fear of what people think, the fear of loss, be it a natural loss in the grieving process of somebody dying, or whether it's lost because we've lost our jobs, whether it's lost because of the possibility of losing finances, even today in the cost of living crisis that we know the bills are going up and we have no more income to come in to cover them. There is a trauma that is going on, but where are we going to focus? Are we going to allow fear to consume us? That false evidence that appears real, F-E-A-R. It looks so real to us, I will never survive. I can't do this. And, and the truth is, no, we cannot do it, but God can. Are we going to focus by faith on a holy God who says he will never leave us nor forsake us, that he will provide for all our needs out of his glorious riches, that he will order our steps, that we are overcomers in him? Are we by faith or are we going to allow the enemy to come and say, there's no way out. This is never going to change. This is how it's going to be and you are going to suffer for it. And as that fear takes hold of us, as it did here with the disciples, they cannot see the truth right in front of them. And many of us are blinded. We cannot see the truth right in front of us right now. Because we're so let our imagination run riot on what we think it's like, we cannot see the truth of what it's really like. We've got to keep our feet on solid ground at the cross in the Lord Jesus Christ to go in truth on what is real, not what we fear could happen, but dealing with the moment right now, in front of us right now. What is God asking of us right now? How are we supposed to respond to the circumstance right now? So they cry out in fear, but Jesus immediately says to them, Jesus today immediately says to each and every one of us that no matter what's going on in your life right now, he says, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. In other words, take courage on where we're walking in this journey of life right now. But Jesus is right in the middle of it. And we have nothing to fear because of who he is. We may be going through the storm, but Jesus is in the boat with us. And the boat may be rocking in the storm, but we will not drown. And what does Peter do? In verse 28, Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, Tell me to come to you on the water. Peter hears the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, a voice they've become familiar with. And all the storm and the rocking of the boat and the noise of the wind and the water coming over them in the, the vision of this apparition that's walking on the water. Even if they could not physically see to recognize the physical form, as Jesus spoke, they should have recognized his voice. How many of us are listening to the wrong voice? That in the middle of the storm, we've become so distracted talking about our problems to anybody and everybody else who will listen, who tell us what we want to hear, that cloud the truth of what really is, that hold us in bondage and give us permission to stay under the circumstances. 
We cannot hear the voice of God because we went in the wrong direction. Who are we looking for in every difficulty of life, in every circumstance of life? Who are we focusing into? All the time we feed on the opinions of man, we are held in bondage in a prison. Everything's magnified out of proportion. It's okay to be, for, for you to be hurt because that person said that. It's okay for you to break your marriage because your marriage isn't what you want it to be. It's okay for you to quit your job because you don't get on with the boss. It's okay for you not to steward your finances rightly. You can go out and lavish upon and buy whatever you want, even if you're in debt. There is a lie of the enemy that wants to bring a peace to give us permission to remain in the circumstance, in the difficulty, in the trauma, in the breakdown of relationships in the breakdown of marriages, in the loss of employment, because our pride will not allow us to stay working for a boss that we do not like. And yet, in the middle of that circumstance, God is trying to teach us something about who he is if we focused upon him. Where did the gratitude go for having a job in the first place to earn the finances to pay the bills? Why are we prepared to give all that up just because somebody doesn't like us? Jesus loves you. Jesus has got a plan for you. And part of his plan is where you are working right now. You may not get on with the boss, but believe me, you are there for purpose before a holy God. And if it's not to teach you something, that you lay down your pride and learn how to humble yourself to the boss. It's that you are in Jesus Christ and you bring Jesus to the boss. There is always a purpose for every way that we are. So Jesus cries out to them, and says, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. And Peter responds, tell me to come to you on the water, if it is you. In other words, am I really hearing the voice? Of, um, am I really hearing the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ? And what does Jesus do? He says, come. He meets Peter exactly where he's at. If Peter has got the faith to step out of that trauma, to step out of that storm, to step out of the boat, to, tr to trust Jesus, to get out of the boat and stand on the water, Jesus simply says, come. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but if that was us, the 12 disciples sitting in a boat out in the middle of the ocean, and I saw Verity get out of the boat to want to walk on water, I think I'd be saying, Verity, don't be so stupid. How can you do that? Please don't listen to this voice. It's going to take you to your death. Yeah? Because we see it all in the natural. Jesus said, come. Peter will have ignored everything that the disciples would have said that would have brought limitation to stop him doing it. And he stepped out of the boat and he walked on the water. He walked on the water by faith, keeping his eyes on Jesus and coming in obedience to Jesus. He did the supernatural impossible. He walked on water. He did the same as Jesus did. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Notice Peter has had the courage, the boldness and the faith to step out of the boat, to go towards the, leaders, towards the Lord Jesus Christ, who simply said, come. And, and Peter walks on the water towards him. But then the storm rages. The wind is there. The, the waters are raging with the waves. He was walking towards Jesus in peace, in purpose, in the right direction, by faith, believing for the victory that he would get to the Lord's side. But then he got distracted by what was right in front of him, the waves coming upon him, the wind that was blowing, and he took his eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ and he began to sink under the circumstances. Where is your focus right now? What are you believing for right now? What have you asked Jesus for in prayer? What is God directing your step into to bring you into obedience to him? What is it that you know that you should do, but you're hesitating? 
What is God asking of you to say, but you won't say it? You won't go to that person that has offended you and say, I choose to forgive you, and will you forgive me for what I've done to you to make peace, to have reconciliation, relationship? You won't go to the boss and say, I'm actually struggling. Can you help me? Because your pride is in the way. You'd rather quit your job than rather than have help to find your way through the job. Where are you at in your marriage that you're so squabbling against the spouse that God has given you? That it's, you're making it all about you, yourself and I and what your spouse does not do for you instead of the preferring of your spouse to ask God, what am I supposed to do to bless them? And the enemy will have you say, it's easier to separate and just admit the marriage is over. God says, no, stay in place and see what I would do as you listen to the voice of Jesus. And I encourage you as the overcomer that you are. So what circumstances could you across our life right now? We say we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We say that we believe. We say that we trust him. We say we have no fear. We know that he loves us and we know that his grace covers us. But what is going on in the natural right now that we are not including him in that journey? Have we been in the silent place before a holy God to hear what God is asking? Have we included him in the journey that we would come into obedience to trust him? And how many times do we go into the prayer room, lay down our burdens at the cross, and then we get up and we take that burden with us? Because we've decided we know better than God on how to sort this out. Peter took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. When we take our eyes off Jesus, we will begin to sink. Every time we do it in our own strength, in our own understanding, in our own way, we will sink under the storm. But what does Jesus do? Peter is afraid and he begins to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Peter got to the end of himself in the circumstance, knowing there's nothing more that he could do. And he says, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches out and he takes hold of him and he rescues him. And then he says, you of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? You know, just thinking then of Peter falling under the waves and Jesus reaching out. You can almost see him grabbing him by the shirt collar to yank him back up, to put him back into the boat. Do you know, I had an occasion when my oldest son, he was only three, no, two and a half. And we'd gone, I'd got the baby brother in my arms, matter of a few weeks old. Myself, my husband and the two children, we go out for the day and my Son wants to go in a rowing boat. So we decide, okay, we'll go on a rowing boat to the lake. And as we stand at the water's edge and I'm holding the baby in my arms, as my husband steps forward to be able to take hold of the boat, to be able to guide my toddler son into it, my toddler son steps forward in front of his father's leg. But as his father bends his knee to reach down, his knee hits my toddler's son and pushes him straight into the water. And I watch horrified, mortified, as my toddler's son goes feet first down under the water of the boating lake. And I praise God for my husband's reaction because he immediately reached down, got hold of his jumper and shirt collar at the back of the neck. He grabbed him by the scruff of his neck, and as quick as he went into the water, feet first down and under, my husband grabbed him and yanked him back up out and put him back onto solid ground. Dripping wet, shot, and screaming, and going all the way back to the car park with your two-and-a-half-year-old son shouting out, My daddy tried to drown me! My daddy pushed me in the water! His truth in that moment, at that time, we knew the truth of what had happened. Jesus knows the truth right now of what is happening with Peter. And he says, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? 
And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Jesus pulls Peter up out of the water. He rescues him. They're both back into the boat. And because the authority of Jesus is there, the storm has to go in Jesus' name. The winds die down. And everybody worships and says, truly, you are the Son of God. Are we willing to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to rescue us today? Are we willing to give everything that is causing us trauma right now? Not just trauma in the current circumstance, in the natural of what we're encountering, in the crisis, the government, the loss of the Queen. Not just the today moment. But what are you holding on to from the past that you are carrying that pain like a, a sort of weighted sack on a rope around your neck? And you've been dragging it around with you all your life since that trauma happened. And all the time you're walking forward with that rope around your neck, with that sack of trouble, that burden that you're buried deep inside you, dragged with you in the spirit, is weighing you down. There is a heaviness. There is a limitation. There is a restriction. You're being led to believe that your identity is not what it is. Somewhere along the journey of life, something has taken hold of us and we believe the lie and the deception of the enemy and we never step out anymore. We never put ourselves in place anymore because we're too conscious of what somebody said. You'll never be able to do that. You'll never go there. You'll never be loved, never accepted. You'll never get promoted. You'll never pass your school exams. You'll never get married. The lies and deception of the enemy, it is the bondage that is the storm that we are going through. And we hold on to it and get anchored down by it, that we are under the oppression of it. Where is Jesus in your story today? How many times do you go into the solitary place to be able to pray and say, I choose to give this burden to you. I choose to lay it down. Lord, speak to me. Speak me your truth. Reveal your love. Show me my true identity in Jesus. Break the bondage of these people's words. We spoke last week about the power of words. How many of us are sitting under what somebody else has said about us that is so negative and they are lies of the enemy that he wants you to believe? And today God wants to set you free. How many of us have not stepped up to believe for that promotion because we believe everybody else is better than us? That is the lie of the enemy that holds us in the bondage. When God says you are his child, he has plans and purpose for your life. And no man will thwart those plans for your life if you just choose to trust in him. Where are you trusting God for the reconciliation of broken relationships? Because nothing is impossible for God. Where are you trusting God for the financial provision to come that you will not sink under this current climatic circumstances, but God will provide for all of your needs? Yes, we all have to do a reassessment of where we are at. Be prepared to let go of what is not important, to have the basics that we all need, and we can all live on a lot less than what we've been living on. If we just declutter our lives from the bondage of the world, that says we have to have, and we come in to surrender to God that he will supply for all of our needs. Where are we at in the storm with Jesus? Jesus, Jesus simply said to Peter, come. And Jesus stepped out of the boat and walked on water. There's a story in Luke 8 of a lady who was sick for 12 years. She had an issue of bleeding. And nobody could heal her. She spent all her money going to the doctors looking for the answer. And in those days, women were ostracized whilst they were on their monthly cycle. This woman has been bleeding for 12 years. She is totally ostracized, cut out of life, not socially acceptable. And yet Jesus comes to town. And that woman comes out of hiding because she's heard about Jesus. And Jesus is surrounded by the crowds. And the woman is totally unnoticed, but she believes. And just as Jesus said to Peter, come, she chooses to go. 
Jesus hasn't even said to her, come. He hasn't even seen her. He hasn't even recognized what's going on. But as he is thrown by the crowd, she goes through the crowd in the determination to take for herself what she desires, which is to be healed. And in the midst of the crowd, she manages to reach out and she touches the hem of Jesus' garden. And as she touches, the power goes out of Jesus and she is healed immediately. Her bleeding stopped. And Jesus stops. And he says, who touched me? And the disciples say, Lord, there's hundreds of people surrounding you. We're all pushing in on you. We don't know who touched you. But Jesus stayed focused. Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And the woman knew she couldn't remain hidden. Because she no longer had to remain hidden. She was no longer unclean. She had been set free. But that momentary fear, oh my goodness, what have I, what have I done? She couldn't go unnoticed. And she came trembling and she fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told Jesus why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And that's what the Lord says to each and every one of us today. But as we step out in faith to believe for the more than in him, our faith heals us. Our faith in him to touch our lives changes all of our circumstance and turns them around for our good and for his glory. But are we desperate enough? That woman, after 12 years of being ill, was desperate enough to reach out and touch, to take for herself what she desired, to come to the supernatural power of Jesus, believing if I can just touch the hem of his garments, I will receive power. But in that touch by faith, reaching out to grasp what Jesus was able to give, she took it for herself. Are we sitting under our circumstances, crying out to God in the pain, but we're saying to God, you do it, God. If you really are God, if you really have this power, you do it, God. No, we are in partnership with the Holy God. God is asking things of us to obey him in. If God is telling you to go and forgive somebody, Go and forgive them, not because they deserve it, not because they say sorry, not because they have any remorse whatsoever for what they have done to you, but dare to trust God that you, being the bigger man in Jesus Christ or the bigger woman in Jesus Christ, will dare to go back to that person and choose to forgive them. Because Jesus is setting us free when we choose to forgive. It's got nothing to do with the other person. The other person will hold us in bondage when we cannot forgive, unforgiveness holds us, us in bondage and we give that person power to keep hurting us for the rest of our lives. And God says enough is enough. Go and forgive that person. Not because they deserve it, but because I want to give you freedom. And only in that forgiveness to that pain will you be set free in Jesus' name. There is a freedom that God wants to bring today, but he asks something of us in the natural to do, that he can do the supernatural in the spirit. And too many times we resist, we, see, we, we actually say no to God. You've probably been sat under a circumstance for years, wondering why it's never been turned around. What was the last thing God asked you to do in that circumstance? And have you done it? Because if we haven't done the last thing that God asked us to do, he can't show us the next best step. And we're holding ourselves in bondage, in a prison, crying out to God, you do it. And God says, I'm willing and I want to, but will you obey me and go and do what I have asked of you to do? This woman was desperate enough to go in the crowds where she wasn't accepted and reach out and touch. Are you willing to go where you are not accepted and reach out and be willing to touch? That the supernatural power of God can come upon the circumstance, set you free, change the circumstance and reconcile broken relationships.
Are you willing to go where you don't want to go? Because you can't see any sense in it, any purpose in it. But if you're willing to trust Jesus, as Jesus says, come, you say, yes, Lord, by faith, I will choose to trust you. Are we willing, truly, to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to help us to walk in, on, on water figuratively in the supernatural power of the Spirit? That we are overcomers. We walk on top of the circumstance. We are no longer under them. Whatever storm you're going through right now, Jesus is in the boat. He wants to calm the storm. But that storm calming starts with our faith journey on how we choose to surrender into him, to be obedient to him, to allow him to have his way. So for whatever you are in petitioning in the prayer mat right now, give it to God, let go, listen for, what, listen for his voice. Peter, come. Jesus says to each and every one of us, come. And as we dare to get out of the boat and stand up in him, and walk towards the Lord Jesus Christ. He is there to rescue us. That even if we, we waver and we begin to sink, he will grab you by the scruff of your neck and yank you back up to your feet and say, my child, don't go there. You're not under. You're over. You are victorious in me. God wants to bless. God wants to release. God wants to set his people free. Are we desperate enough like the woman with the issue of blood to reach out to touch him? Are we trusting enough like Peter to say, if it's you, Lord, I come? Are we brave enough to go where Jesus wants us to go because he simply says, come? Who are you looking for in your circumstance? What are you looking for? What are you expectant for? And if we don't go out of this room today expectant for God to do the more than we can ask or imagine, we're missing the point. Because if you choose to go out of the door today, thinking and feeling exactly the same way as you did when you came in about the storm of your life that's taking place right now, you're missing the point. Jesus' invitation today is come, put it into my hands, step out with me, obey what I ask. And receive your turnaround, your breakthrough, your freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.